I want to talk about Venn diagrams and set operations. These are two uh, rather related things. You've already seen operations before. Operations that you're familiar with already are the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, to name just a few. Um, you've probably seen several others, but those are the, the big ones that most people have seen already. So for sets, we don't have these, but we have similar things. These are operations that you're familiar with. And we're going to talk about some ones for, to use on sets. And I'm also going to talk about Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams help you understand what's really going on with a set. So let's go back to two sets that maybe I've talked about before. Um, set M is going to be the set of all of the X's, where X is going to be a 2011 VC math faculty. It's very specific. P is going to be the set of all the things where the X is the 2011 VC physics faculty. And I'm also going to have E, where it's the same stuff, but this time it's all of the English faculty. So these are the three sets that I'm talking about. And now let's talk about their Venn diagrams. And once I have Venn diagrams that are going to show us what these things look like, then I can talk to you about the set operations. So here's what a Venn diagram is. Venn diagrams have two main parts. One part is a bunch of circles. Each circle represents a set. And you put any of the elements in that set you like. And the bigger part of the Venn diagram is a big large box. And this is called the universal set. Capital U, capital S there. And this universal set, the idea is it has all of the things in our universe in it. Um, this universe does not have to be as big as the universe you and I live in. It just has to be big enough to hold all the things we're talking about. So if I go up here and look at my three sets that I have, these are all talking about the 2011 VC faculty, which means for the sake of my Venn diagram that I want to create with this VC math faculty in it, the box I cook up that I call U, this set U is going to be all of the 2011 VC faculty. I don't have to include students, I don't have to include staff, I don't have to include people in California. I just need to include all of the 2011 VC faculty, anyone who's a faculty member here at the college then. Once I do that, then I can start drawing my circles. Here's my circle for M. This is all the math faculty. Then I've got my circle for physics. And I've got my circle for English. But this Venn diagram isn't quite correct because it's showing that there's these gaps here. If these gaps were really here, this would be what we call disjoint. They have nothing in common. They're separate. On the other hand, if I had drawn one of these circles inside the other, I shrunk it down, moved it inside here, then I would have been saying that the physics department, everyone who's in the physics is already part of math. And that wouldn't be quite true because there, we have physics teachers here who don't also teach math. However, there can be some overlap. And so we want to talk about what that means when I have some sort of overlap going on. So let me draw my universal set once again. Here's you. Here's all my math people. What I've got really happening here at VC is here's my physics people. And in this little space in between here, we've got is Mr. White. He teaches in both. None of the English people teach math or physics, so they can live over here, continuing to be disjoint. But right here, what we've got is some common ground. So the whole purpose of a Venn diagram is to show what the sets are looking like in some sort of a picture. Just like if you had an equation in some other class, you might have learned how to graph it. 
And this would be your y-axis, this would be your x, and this would all give you a picture. Well, a Venn diagram is trying to give you a picture of what a set looks like. So with our Venn diagrams in this book, we're going to talk about two types. The first type is the type of Venn diagram that has two sets in it. I'm going to call them set A and set B. The other Venn diagram that we're going to have is going to be just a little bit bigger. It's going to have three sets in it, A, B, and C. For C, let me go ahead and use another color here, just so we can kind of be clear how he's working. Let's do it for B as well. When we're talking about these different areas in the Venn diagrams, notice there's these different overlaps. Each of these has a name, and we use the Roman numerals, capital I for one, capital two, uh, double I for two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. These are the ones we're going to use. We number each of these places. Because see, here in place number one, this is all the stuff that's inside of set A, but is not also inside of set B. Then in this joint area, I call that part two, that's the stuff that lives in both A and B. My example of this already was in the VC math department and physics department. We have Mr. White who lives in both. He teaches both sides of the classes. Then I have area three. It's the stuff that lives in B that is only living in B. And then in this diagram here, where I only have two sets, I only have four spaces, I have region four. Region four is all the stuff that's part of the universe, but that is not part of A and B. If I go and talk about a group of three sets, well, I'm going to number the areas just the same. Uh, let me move this stuff over here to give myself just a little bit more space so that I can make this guy just a smidge bigger show what's really going on here. So this is region one. It's all the stuff that's just in A. It doesn't have any common ground in B or C. This is region two. It's the stuff that's common to B and A, but it is not part of C. Region three, just as before, it's the things that are unique to B. And then I have regions four, five, six, seven, and eight. These are the regions that we talk about in this class. Two different types of Venn diagrams. Some of the Venn diagrams have just two sets in them, and some of them have three sets going on in them. When you use Venn diagrams, you're always interested in finding what's common to these guys, what's common in this area, what's common to these two, what's common to these two that's not part of this one, what's common to all three of them, who's unique in these different areas. You're always looking for that kind of stuff. And you're always trying to figure out what's special. So there's lots of word problems that are going to work on that. And we'll work through some examples. But once we've got the Venn diagrams here, now I've got enough of a picture going on with my sets to describe a couple of special situations and then talk about um, some set operations. So for Venn diagrams, we already said that if I have two things separate here, we call this disjoint. We talked about subsets a couple sections ago. If I have one set that's bigger than another set, then what I'm saying is that set B is a subset, a strict subset of A. These guys are always my universes. Then we've got this situation where we've got this overlap going on here in between A and B. If there's something actually here that isn't the empty set, we know they have some common ground. And that's what we're talking about here. So let's talk about some set operations. We've got two of them, two main ones. One is intersection. This stands for intersection. That's what we call it. The way that I help remember and remind myself what it looks like is if I have this, 
upside down shape, if I draw a bar across it, it looks like an A, and this means and. For intersection, what I mean is that something in one of the sets is going to be in both of the sets. It has to be in the first one and in the second one. How would I write this? Well, let's go back to my example of math. And while I'm doing that example, I'm also going to write it in our general language. And this is one of the big things in math. We do general letters for things. So the general formula looks like this. I'm intersecting A and B. And what do I mean by that in my roster notation? I mean all the x's, such that x is one of the elements of A, and x is an element of B. But how I understand my general rule is with an example, and my example of that is this. Here's my universe. Here's all the people in the VC 2011 math department. Here's all the people in the VC 2011 physics department. I've got Mr. White here in the middle of both. We've got Wiley, Yasko, Yang, and Poggle. over here who are only math people. And I've got Mr. Lee over here who's only a physics people. And so when I say M intersect P, what I mean to get out of this is the set that only holds Mr. White. He's the guy in this common ground here in the middle. And what I mean is that Mr. White is a member of the math department and he's a member of the physics department. So he gets to be part of both. So that's what intersection means. We connect it to logic words and, which means that later on when we start talking about logic stuff in some of the later chapters, you're going to see this and business come up again. In math, when I say and, it means you live in the thing on the left and the thing on the right. You are a member of both. And you, it doesn't... It's not enough to just be a member of one. You have to be a member of both. The other set operation that we've got is union. It looks like this. The word that we say when we see this shape is union. If I try to draw a little slash through it, it doesn't mean anything. And union, we use in math the letter, uh, the, the English word or to represent union. You can be in one or the other, which gets you a bigger area. So, again, using my general shapes and notation, I would talk to you about A union B, and I could describe it in roster notation. It's all the elements where either that element lives in the first set or that element lives in the second set. Let's go back to our example up here of the physics department. Let's drag this example down here and look at it. I've got it here again. I'm talking about union. Let's talk about math, union, physics. Well, what does this say? First, I grab all the things that are parts of A. I grab all the things that are parts of math. So I have Wiley, I've got Yasko, I've got Yang, I've got Poggle, I've got White. Then I grab all the things that are part of the second set, which for us now is P in my specific example, all the people in physics. And that involves Lee. I don't have to write white a second time because I've already ri written white in once. And remember, sets don't allow for duplicates. You only put one copy of each thing in your set box. So this is the union. I think in general, for union, people are, would be pretty happy to see Wiley, Yasuo, Yang, and Poggle, and to see Lee. I think it's the white that messes with people's heads. Mr. White is both a math person and a physics person, and that means he gets to be in both. And so when I union up the sets, we see or, and if you think or, you're thinking, eh, well, he's both. Yeah, but he's in the math as well as being in the physics. If you build it up by first saying who's all in math, and then say, all right, now let's list all the people in physics, and remember that in sets, you don't double write people's names. 
You only include one person one single time because sets don't understand duplicates. Once you've thrown in one thing in the set, you can pull it out as many times as you need to. It automatically makes copies for you. Then you're good. So that's intersection and union. Now we just have to talk about a couple special examples using these things. So let's go back and talk about the empty set. Remember, the empty set is always a subset of every other set because everybody has always some, has some empty space inside of them. So here's some facts. If I intersect A with an empty set, I'm saying what's the common ground between the empty set and A? Well, the empty set is an A. So what's the common ground between the empty set and the one thing in A that is the empty set? Well, it's just the empty set. On the other hand, if I do A union the empty set, the empty set's already part of A. I'm trying to add in as a second. That would be like if there hadn't been a Mr. Lee in the physics department, and I was saying, well, Mr. White teaches physics, and so I take the math, and then I add the physics department, and there wouldn't be any change. So you union a set with the empty set. It's always going to be the original set. Again, this is because the empty set's already a part of the original set. Doing this union doesn't add anything into the mix. So I've talked about two set operations. Let's talk about the third. This one's called complement. It doesn't mean to make the set feel good about itself. It means to find its partner, its, its opposite, that makes it complete. And when we think about something that makes us complete, we're thinking about the entire universe again. So here's what complement really means. If this is my set A, and this is my entire universe, the complement of set A is going to be this area that I'm shading in. It's all the stuff in the universe that's not part of A. Together, A and A complement complete the whole universe. So the symbology is this little tick mark up here, A prime. In some books, it's also written like this with a little C. In some other books, you'll find it written with an A and a bar over it. All three of these things are perfectly fine. I think our book uses this, so I'll try to use this the most. But if A complement with a little C helps you remember better what's going on, that's fine too. So once I've got this third set complement going on, notice to understand union, I just need two sets. I never use the universe. To understand intersection, I also just needed two sets. I never needed to talk about the universe. To understand complement, though, I need to have a very good understanding of what's in my universe. The complement of all the VC math faculty would be a very long list indeed if I was talking about the universe of all humans on the planet. It would be some 8 billion people almost. But if I understand my universe to only be the 2011 uh, VC faculty, it's still a long list, but it's only about 150 people that I have to list out, which is much more manageable. All just all the people who aren't in the math department.